Have you ever been in a situation where you thought, holy crap, I'm actually disabled? I know how that sounds. You have a disability. What are you talking about, Susan? Well, that feeling is pretty confronting, especially when it happens repeatedly. Where do you find the resilience to keep going when you have a body that requires you to think about added challenges? How do you feel confident going to the shops or going anywhere when there's a running commentary in your head about what your plan B, C, D and E is if everything goes wrong? How do these things intersect when you're trying to find meaning and purpose and wanting to do the things that you enjoy? You're listening to episode 22, the final episode of 2022. Hi, my name is Emily. I am a social worker at Spinal Cord Injuries Australia, and I currently am developing and running their suite of resilience programs. Emily and I talk about gaining and retaining confidence, meaning and purpose, especially when there are situations where unavoidable everyday anxieties happen. Confronting those holy crap, I'm actually disabled days and finding your community. For people who aren't familiar with you, you were on a previous episode for Spinal Cord Injuries Awareness Week, but do you want to just give the audience a brief overview as to just your story? So I sustained my spinal cord injury back in 2012, just over 10 years ago now. Uh, I had a snowboarding accident and I broke my C5, so I'm a tetraplegic. Before my injury was, you know, as I think many of us are that experience spinal cord injuries, we always seem to be active participants, sporty. I don't know whether, you know, that leads into why we get injured anyway. Um, traveling around, you know, doing my thing as a 22 year old, trying to find my, find my place in life. And so I experienced my accident and then obviously went through that whole rehab process and in doing so decided that I wanted to have a bit of a career change going from business and, and move more into psychology and social work, which is what led me to doing peer support for SCIA to begin with on the wards. Um, and then finally, once I uh, qualified as a social worker, moving more into kind of social work role. How important do you think the connection of somebody with lived experience is to somebody else who's also experiencing a disability um, when, you know, if they they meet you and, and you're a social worker and you're doing all this stuff? Have you found that people are more receptive? Yeah, I think so. I think it breaks down some barriers. There's this idea of I know what they've been through in a way. Um, I don't have to talk about, you know, how hard it is or imagine how hard it is. I know how hard it is. Um, And so when someone says, "I, I see what you're saying, I understand what you're saying, I hear what you're saying, that they do from a, a personal level. So although I don't think it's absolutely necessary that someone was as a social worker has to have been through domestic violence if they're dealing with people with domestic violence, I think it, it, there's an element that having some lived experience does help to a degree. Just in your experience with your injury and the significant impact, did you go through a period of grief loss, trauma? I can only imagine yes. I don't know whether the grief and loss and trauma really hit me until maybe six months, 12 months down the track when you you kind of, you have your injury and I think that there's always this hope that you will defy the odds, that you will be that one in a million that walks out of the rehab centre. And I think at the beginning, sometimes you've got to hold on to that just to get you through that intense acute uh stage and so it probably wasn't until six 12 months down the track where i started to realize i don't think i'm going to be that one in a million i don't think that i'm going to walk out of here this think this is it for me i was really faced i guess with what had happened and what my life was going to be and how what it is going to be is different to what I had planned for myself. And so you start to question, well, what am I going to do for work? How am I going to be independent in getting around in the community? Uh, Am I going to find a partner, have a family? All of these things perhaps that uh, you may have seen in your future, all of a sudden they're not so certain uh, and perhaps not possible depending on your your dreams and desires so there was that real point in which I had to reevaluate in myself well what am I going to do how am I going to do it you know what's realistic what isn't 
Um, and I think that was really challenging. And there's definitely a period of time after I left rehab where I was trying to figure that out, where it was a little, you know, you, you're low. You, you, there's not a lot going on. Maybe you're sitting at home for long periods of time. You're only doing therapies a couple of times a week. That was a really difficult period, I think, until I found what I wanted to do. What was the turning point where you finally thought, I can be a new version of myself, I guess? It's funny. I'm not sure there was like this light bulb moment. I think it happened really gradually as I became more comfortable in myself and my abilities and kind of learned what what I was able to do and then started to look forward and think, okay, what, what does that mean for my future? And I had always been interested in psychology and it was something that I was thinking about doing prior to my accident. It's always hard to change course in your life and having a spinal cord injury, I just realized, well, if I'm if I'm going to make a change, then this is the time to do it. If I'm going to start doing something new, um, I may as well do it now. I mean, I've got nothing else to lose. I really am at the bottom here. That's when I started exploring uh, university. And I started off slow, you know, doing one or two subjects a semester and then, and then built up as I got more comfortable in my ability. It's very interesting that you said, you know, for the first six, 12 months, you thought that you might be that 0.001% of people that were going to, you know, be able to walk, Mm -hmm. I guess, regularly again. At that stage, did you even think, what sort of future did you think that you had? You know, even if you were in the hope of walking, did you feel like you were going to be like, I'm going to be living all the dreams that I had before that sort of thing? I don't really know if I had thought any further than recovery. Yeah, okay. I think I was just focused on the physical recovery and trying to get as much physical return as I could to be independent and, you know, transfer by myself and and drive. And that was my, I guess, real focus for a while. Life beyond that, there wasn't. I don't know whether there was life beyond that for a while. What, what did you think your psychology um, trajectory was going to be pre-accident? I'm not really even that sure. I think I wanted to work with young women, perhaps high school women, girls, ladies, uh, female identifying, looking at uh, mental health and well-being, confidence, body image. How can we make young women more resilient, I guess? So yes, having a spinal cord injury and then deciding, well, if I'm going to do it, then let's have a look at it now. And then realizing that I had a, a passion for uh, bettering the life of people with disability and uh, it was kind of where uh, I wanted to go. And I think and I, I had written about this for a piece I did when I was studying, but I would say it wasn't until I had my injury that I kind of suddenly started hearing the word no more often. You know, I'm I do identify, I acknowledge the fact that I am a white cis female, middle class. I didn't face many barriers growing up. I went to a good school, you know, went to university. And then I sustained my disability and all of a sudden people are saying, well, no, you can't do that. Or no, you can't access there. And I was like, but why? Why can't I do that? Why can't I go there? Identifying that, I realized, well, my... I guess my passion started to develop in terms of looking at, well, how can we address those and change them into a yes so that people with disability can feel that they aren't facing as many barriers in their life. It, 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 you're still helping people be resilient. It's just from a different perspective. But what did you end up learning about yourself that you didn't expect to learn? I think that I am more confident and comfortable in my own skin now that I have my disability funnily enough I wouldn't say I was shy I was a little bit shy I was just reserved I was an observer probably and I think I always struggled with a little bit with being comfortable in my own skin and and confident in myself having my disability and I mean it, I'm 10 years down the track now I now look back and I think well this is just who I am can't change it I like myself and hopefully other people will see that and also like me. But if they don't, then that is also fine. You don't have to get along with everyone in the world. Oh, amen, Emily. Amen. <laughs> I think there's um, I think there's something to say about always struggling to try and get people to like you. 
it becomes very, very exhausting. Hmm. Not everyone's going to like you, and that's fine. Like, who cares? And I think I always was scared of being judged by others before my injury, and then you have your injury, it's so physically apparent people are going to judge you, and I just thought, who cares what people think? People are going to have opinions of me before they meet me, just by seeing me. That is on them. I could maybe work towards changing the public you know, societal perception of disability, but all I can do is work on myself. There are people out there who uh, either acquire a disability traumatically or um, have had their disability for their whole life who might not feel that confident about themselves. What do you think are some of the common insecurities that can feed into confidence issues and and struggling to find meaning and purpose? I come across very confident, and I, I am in a way, but there's still this underlying level of anxiety that is ever present, and it doesn't go away. And that's something that you have to, I guess, deal with on a daily basis. The anxiety of, I'm going to exit the house, I know I'm going to be judged in a certain way, just certain looks. The anxiety of, am I going to be able to access the place when I get there? When I get up to the bus stop, is the bus driver going to see me? Is he going to get annoyed that he has to lower the ramp? Am I going to have to move someone out of their seat? Do I have to ask someone to put the seat up? Am I going to be able to push the button properly? Because sometimes they're in different places. Sometimes they don't work. Will I be able to get off? That's just on a bus trip. Then I'm worrying about... I'm going to get a cup of coffee. Well, got my card out of my wallet. Am I going to drop my card? Who's going to give me the coffee if he doesn't want to walk around the bench to give it to me? There's all these, there's this running commentary in my head creating, and the more I think about it and the more I plan for events, the the more anxiety I get. I 100% have PTSD just listening to you right now, especially mm. that bus thing. Yeah, go on. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I think that, I continue to struggle with that in many different aspects of my life. And it's all kind of stemming from my disability. Moving forward in terms of getting, you know, getting out there, finding meaning and purpose and what I want to do, I I had to first address that so that I could then feel confident in getting out and looking at, well, what do I enjoy? What do I want to do? What do I find meaningful? What are the activities that I want to get involved with and then start to explore? Yeah, and you mentioned something earlier on about appearance, I think is something that a lot of people with disabilities struggle with, especially if it's something that's so physically obvious, you know, and that could really, that can really feed into not just a confidence issue, but knowing like where you're going to go or who you're going to be as a person, you know? Yeah, and I think that like, Part of the journey was for me was learning to accept myself, my image, my new being, my place in the world, so that when I enter into the community, I felt more, I could put out aura of confidence, which then I think opened, uh, meant I was more open to other people or people could feel that and then feel more comfortable in my presence as well so rather than entering into the room and being you know you got your your arms hunched over maybe you got your head down you know you've curled into yourself people are naturally maybe going to want to not approach you and start a conversation or be open to you um yep. but if or i will take you seriously yeah or take you seriously exactly you know especially if you're entering into an employment situation Mm. You know, so learning to have more confidence in myself meant I could open myself up more and I think uh, open myself up to the world and the people around me as well. Definitely. I mean, people can't see this podcast because it's clearly recorded on audio, but <laughs> it, did, it did just remind me of, and, and maybe this has happened to you uh, for a very, very long time. I used to, and we talked about in the last episode about being congratulated, right? For doing um, everyday things. But there's also on the complete other spectrum, I've had people cry at the sight of me. <laughs> And I have no idea if this has happened to you, but it's certainly happened to me um, on more than one occasion. And then, um, you know, because because of that, that might feed into somebody's insecurity, depending on what sort of personality they have. Also thinking about all those people who keep asking whether or not um, you live alone. That was a really big one for me as well. Again, no one's watching this podcast, but my hair is 
so bright. And since I started dyeing my hair 10 years ago, I have had almost a distinct drop of people asking me if I live alone or (laughs) emotional. (laughs) I think it's just because the hair is a distraction point for them. So like a lot of the conversation now is literally surrounded by hair. You and I, you were correct in saying that we do give we do give an air that we're quite confident, right? Mm. And then there are just like seven thousand anxieties underneath. Yeah. But for somebody who is struggling really hard um, to even gain that confidence, and there's so many outside insecurities, how can you come more to terms with the anxieties that you can't avoid? Mm. Yeah, I think it's a great question, and I think that comes down to seeking support or assistance. I don't think that uh, we can deal with our own mental health concerns in a in our own vacuums, whether it be a, a psychologist, a counsellor, a social worker, um, other peers. And I guess that brings me to the program that SCIA run, the RAP program, which specifically looks at uh, mental well-being and, and mental health you know, what does it look like when we are not well? When we, What does it look like when we are experiencing anxiety? What does it feel like? Um, and then through that process, identifying tools and strategies, just simple tools and strategies to help us manage those on a daily basis and creating a routine for ourselves to help us uh, support our mental health and well-being and then it it kind of proceeds further into looking at when things start to get worse when things start to break down what happens when you enter into a crisis and having a plan for each of these scenarios what everyone can do perhaps in preparation by themselves if they aren't able to get to a psychologist or they aren't able to join the rep program now is just start to think about those simple, safe tools and strategies that they can put into their day-to-day life to support them with the mental health and well-being. So, for example, that could just be really simply making sure you eat really well every day, making sure you drink enough water, um, things like making the bed, perhaps that makes you feel better that you've, you've you know, started their day off really well and you've you've achieved something it could be exercise meditation just about i guess those self-care strategies to start with uh as a first step what does resilience mean to you resilience is just having the strength to bounce back in a way as almost you know being having the strength to tackle challenges I know that there has been research into kind of what is resilience and I have to go back and read through it again to, to remind myself, but there's definitely personality traits that lend themselves to people being more resilient. And what I sometimes find interesting is what about a person inherently makes them resilient? Is it is something that's inherent or is it something that we can develop? I like to think it's something that can be developed as we address our mental health and then also look at the concept of post-traumatic growth, which I think you had uh, touched on with Sky. It reminds me of uh, our other program that we have, the Engage program, where we look at post-traumatic growth and how we can achieve post-traumatic growth by looking at meaningful relationships and meaningful activities in our life, what strengths we have and where we can find resilience moving forward to adjusting to life after acquiring a disability. Because of the ebb and flow of emotions when it comes to disability, do you find that the people that come through the resilience programs, is it really more about motivation? Oh, I mean, by, by that, I mean motivating themselves to keep going or, you know, what, what have you observed from, um, from the participants going through the program? Like what are some of the reasons, you know, they could be, I don't know, 10, 20 years down the track or two years in, is it, is it a motivation thing? I think it's a multitude of things. So we have people that attend the programs that, as you say, are perhaps they're a year or two down the track and they've just come to terms with their disability and they're looking to support their mental health and also find direction in their life. But then we also have individuals that attend the program that are 
40, 50 years post-injury and have maybe gone through a, a life change. For example, maybe their relationship is broken down or they've retired. And again, they're looking at, I'm now maybe aging with a spinal cord injury. What does that mean for my uh, my health? What does retirement mean for what I'm going to do now? What activities am I going to do? You know, How am I going to participate in the community? And so it's about then taking those concerns and, and creating a direction in, in goals and a plan, I guess. I find that most people that attend the course, they're already looking for a way to move forward. That's why they've joined the course. So our role as facilitators is just to take that desire that's already there and channel it, kind of introduce them to some of the research and some of the, the content about post-traumatic growth. Post-traumatic growth is all about the idea that we can, through a challenging circumstance, see positive growth. And I always say to clients, that doesn't mean that life is better after a spinal cord injury, but it's that we can start to identify that there may be areas in our life where we have grown positively, whether that's we can see that we have uh, developed a specific strength or so maybe we're more patient um, or maybe that's a new activity that we can identify that we enjoy t- participating in or perhaps it's a relationship that we find is stronger. Perhaps we can see those things already but perhaps we need help seeing where that lies and we kind of try and identify and create goals towards finding a meaningful activity and engaging in that. I mean, they could be any at any stage and they don't really know who they are, right? Or they're trying to find something that they, to channel Marie Kondo, brings them joy. But there's certain stages in somebody's disability journey, no matter what it is, where you have moments where you feel like you are so disabled. Sometimes when I'm, I'm trying to pick up stuff off the ground, I keep dropping it and picking it up and things fall and they drop it and I can't really pick it up properly and it's at that moment where I'm just like could I be any more disabled right now and it just really is exhausting. I think that it is very uh, important to start normalizing the experience of disability in its impact on our mental health well-being in in goals. Um, I think as Sky said in her podcast we all experience grief, trauma and loss And this comes and goes throughout our lives living with a disability. As you mentioned, you know, sometimes you're you're not confronted with the, uh, your disability until something happens, like you drop something or, you know, for me, I find I'm not, I'm not confronted with my disability until I leave my desk, which is all set up for me and go try and work somewhere else. And all of a sudden, I'm, I can't because it's not set up for me. And I'm like, wow, I'm really disabled. Uh, and not until those points. So it's kind of acknowledging that the grief and the loss at that time is normal. That grief and loss will wane and wax throughout our lives with disability. And, and that is fine. And it's about how can we equip ourselves with the tools and strategies to help us through those moments when we're experiencing more anxiety, depression, feelings of loss and grief. So can I ask if it's not too much, what do you what is your coping strategies or what tools do you have when you feel like I'm real disabled right now? I think I am someone that tends to bottle bottle it up mm. and take it on the chin. And it just kind of builds and builds. So my strategy is when I'm feeling that way, when these emotions arise, to talk to someone, whether that's, uh, you know, uh, my husband or my mum or a, a professional, um, that is my first step. Um, so that would be one strategy I would use. Breaking it down to I went somewhere today and I felt really disabled. I now feel really shit. I'm going to go home and I'm going to do a face mask and I'm going to do some self-care. I'm going to have a glass of wine and some chocolate. And I acknowledge that part of that is just about a a routine of self-care. So definitely different levels of strategies that I use. 
I guess you also need to figure out what sort of healthy uh, ways of coping with those days are because people can very easily turn to alcohol um, as a coping mechanism mm. and then that might spiral there or or, or even um, eating, uh, emotional eating. Is it probably a big one as well? Yeah, absolutely. What do you suggest for people who might have might even be turning to that now and want to find a way to make their coping strategy just mm. healthier. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we talk about this in the program. We say there are tools and strategies, but there's also um, traps. Uh, so and one of those traps could be maybe one glass of wine or a night is perfectly fine. But when you start to drink two or three a night, then you it's kind of signals that perhaps something is not quite right. Perhaps you're not feeling as well as you had hoped. And what other tools and strategies can we start putting in place at that time to address what's actually going on? And then again, it takes it back to, there'll be different for every person. And we stress this as well. Strategies that work for me will not necessarily work for someone else. I mean, I like doing face masks, but not everyone else does. Um, and it's really about identifying what exactly works for you. Is it um, instead of going for that second glass of wine, instead doing five minutes of mindfulness meditation, or instead of reaching for that second glass of wine, is it about saying, maybe I just need to go and have a bit of a chat with my husband or partner, whoever it may be. So I think part of knowing how to address your mental health and mental well-being is really a reflective process. Um, or looking at yourself when you're well, what you look like, what you feel like, um, and perhaps when things start to break down, what, what's changing around you. So it highlights to you, I need to do something. So for example, for, my, for myself, and I'm talking, I'm talking a lot about skincare right now, but like part of my day-to-day -day routine is I like to do, you know, my morning skincare, put my serum on, my moisturizer, and in the evening I do the same thing. As soon as I stop doing that, as soon as I think, you know what? I can't be bothered. I just am not feeling, I can't be bothered. It signals to me, mm, something's not quite right. I'm this thing that I really enjoy doing. I don't want to do it anymore. So at that point, when I have that thought, I then think, okay, what are the tools and strategies that I have in my toolbox to put in place to help me start to address what I'm feeling? So there's things in life that we will never be able to change our disabilities being one of those things. For us to progress forward, no matter what your goal is, from what I'm gathering from this entire episode, is that you can't change the things that you can't change. But everything else is basically you anyway. And it's all about how you're about to approach the things that you can't change and how you're going to care less about the things that you can't change to direct how you feel about yourself. Am I... Yeah, in a way, yeah. One of the concepts that we address in uh, the RAP course is uh, the concept of personal responsibility, of taking personal responsibility for our own mental health and well-being um, and how we react to certain situations. Um, we can't control what people say to us, but perhaps we can control how we react to, to it. When people do say things that may be hurtful and mean and, and and not very nice it, it, we can't change the fact that they've said that and can't change the fact that it makes us feel horrible uh but what can we do to kind of support ourselves through uh those emotions and it, it, it's really difficult I, I think that uh i hope i in this podcast i i'm not making it seem like well you just have your tools and strategies in, in that one you know, help you improve your mental wellness. I don't think it's it's that simple. It's a really complex process. And I think that's why it's really important to, to reach out to healthcare professionals, friends, family, take part in support groups to have these conversations. Um, because without these conversations, we can't normalize the fact that we're all going through these same emotions and these same feelings to different degrees and about different things. But there are things that we can be doing 
individually, but also together as a community to help support ourselves uh, in improving. And you say that, and you're 10 years into your injury, and I can only assume, like, and every day would be like, you know, an up and down. It just never ends. <laughs> and I think that's, I think that's something that, um, that could be something that could be a bit of a misconception that at some point you're going to feel fine one day. You'll just, you'll just figure it all out and it will just all be amazing. But it's actually just a continuous journey. Yeah, it's a continuous journey. And you also have to take into consideration the fact that we are just living normal lives and and having to deal with the emotions of regular life and be depressed and it's not anything to do with your disability it's just you you're just depressed or you can have a uh, relationship breakdown and you have to manage that and again that might be nothing to do with your disability or whatever it is that you go through in life we've got to address those things too it just happens that we have this additional thing that we are also dealing with or I hope through the podcast we've just really stressed that mental health and well-being and finding meaning and purpose after acquiring a disability uh, is a process, it's a challenge, but there are supports out there for you and you, you don't have to go through the process alone. And I think a lot of the time, especially that initial period after leaving rehab, it can feel like that. So... I would encourage you to reach out to your support systems, whether that's a professional or a friend or family, and also to look at the programs that we are running or other organizations are running to link you in with additional supports that can help, additional strategies that can help, and also just to connect with others with a disability. Yes, because connecting with others with a disability is really, really important. I don't think people fully, and I actually didn't fully understand how important it was until I, st- until I started working here. Because up until working here, I probably knew like peripherally two people with a disability my whole mm-hmm. life. Mm-hmm. And then you meet these people and suddenly it's just like, oh, we're not alone, guys. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think we all in life, again, as human beings, just want to be, we just want to know that we are not alone in whatever we are going through. There are other people that are experiencing similar things and are challenged by them, or maybe that they have successfully moved past whatever they're going through or uh, adapted, whatever it is that you want to to say and I think what has been really nice about the programs we're running they're online and even online we have been able to develop connections and relationships and that has not hindered the process and they're across country and our participants have continued to stay in contact after participating in the programs I think it's something we hear from a community that they want more of sometimes it's just about finding that one other person that you can cool and say I went through this today uh, and it was really difficult and they can say oh yeah I had to deal with that last week last year today as well whatever it may be and just to both have that yeah it's really shit or yeah it's really tough and that's all you have to say because they know but there's someone else there that can understand what you're going through You can find SCIA's Resilience Programs on our website at scia.org.au. If you're listening to this on Spotify or Apple Podcast, throw us a five-star review. It helps people search for this podcast. Like I said in the beginning, this is the final episode for the year, and I'll be back in 2023 with episode 23. That's not intentional, but I like it. This episode has been written, edited, and produced by me, Susan Wood, logo art by Kobe Ann Moore. Check the show notes on this episode to find our resource hub and anything we've spoken about in this episode. Thank you for listening.